Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining Thompson Hines' weekly coffee chat series. My name is Mark Miner, and I'm a senior counsel in Thompson Hines Investment Management Practice Group. I'm delighted to have joining me today Bill Riley, an associate director at Oyster Consulting and a friend and colleague of Maroon Years. <laughs> General counsels, chief compliance officers, and compliance staff of registered broker dealers and investment advisors must stay prepared for periodic or for cause examinations or regulatory inquiry. Whether just a checkup or assessing risk of an impending exam, knowing vulnerabilities in advance can be a game changer. Today, we will pinpoint key areas and best practices for advisors to consider before an examiner shows up and share insights on the mock exam process and why it has become an invaluable tool. If you have any questions or comments during today's program, we encourage you to join the discussion by using the Q&A box on your control panel. We will try to address your comments as we move through the discussion and we encourage them. And we will also try to leave a bit of time at the end to answer additional questions as well. And we promise to follow up with any that we don't get to during our time together. So thanks for joining us today. Let's uh, let's uh, jump right in. Um, we're not gonna go over uh, the authority for uh, examination, uh, but generally, uh, as our listeners may be aware, there are different authorities under which they may be subject to an examination. It's always been uh, my view, and I'm sure Bill, you will share yours, uh, that the best opportunity to kick the tires on what an exam um, may mean for you um, is not uh, when everybody's hair is on fire after uh, some uh, response. Uh, each institution has a different way of conducting the exams. Uh, it might be the SEC, it might be FINRA, it might be um, state securities uh, regulators and a few others, but there are some general rules of the road that I, I think apply to a review of your systems and compliance procedures for any exam. Um, so let's talk about some reasons to conduct uh, mock exams. Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think, look, I think one of the things that, one of the first things that we wanna talk about when we're dealing with conducting mock exams, is it something that is done in-house? Is it something that is done by the firm? Is it something where you might uh, look to an option of uh, looking at an independent third party, a consultant or a law firm or something. So, and I think there's a couple of reasons why using a consultant um, might be advantageous. And I'll talk for a second about my, you know, my general experience. But as, as a consultant and as a former regulator, I used to run the state of Florida examination program, okay? I have either conducted or reviewed hundreds and possibly thousands of examinations uh, and investigations, okay? I created exam modules uh, for NASA that when I left there almost nine years ago, some of those modules are still in use. They've been amended, they've been updated, but in principle, you know, they were very similar to when I was there, okay? Um, I've looked at creating examination modules for various firms. I've created and reviewed policies and procedures uh, for firms as a consultant and also reviewed them uh, as a regulator. Um, in addition to that, I've also participated as a regulator in the creation of various rules and regulations that were adopted for use um, in conjunction with examinations, those things that are reviewed during an examination. So I guess the point is, is that if you're looking at doing something in-house versus doing something third party, one of the things to look at would be, and you know, would be look at, again, at, at a consultant, a lot of that has to do with availability costs and what you're looking at. But I think what it does by using an independent third party, it allows you to, it allows me to know what your peers are, are doing, okay? What are your competitors doing? What are they doing as far as policies, procedures? and so forth. And more importantly, what is a regulator looking at? When I was with the state of Florida, I had to know SEC, FINRA, NASA model rules, 
and Florida rules and regulations, okay? So I bring all of that forward with me now to being a consultant. So a lot of expertise, a lot of variation, a lot of knowledge of what works, what doesn't work. Uh, so those things are all important when you're looking at whether or not to use a consultant um, or to do this in-house. I, I think the one thing, Mark, you also, when you were talking about, why do we conduct mock audits, okay? Firms have reasons, okay? So what happens is firm may look at something to say, hey, we've been in business for an awful long time and we've never seen a regulator or it's been a number of years since we've seen a regulator. Maybe we ought to, you know, bring someone in and kind of take a look at what's happening. Some of the things that I saw as a regulator quite often and also as a consultant, I see where firms engage in certain activities that are new to the firm that, have, that were not there maybe at the time the last examination was done. And some of the things we're talking about, maybe the firm has now added branch offices, whereas the last exam two years ago, they had no branch offices. So we may want to look at, you know, how do those branch offices operate? How's the supervision? Uh, you know, how is it dealing with their clients? Some other things we're talking about is, you know, changes in business. Have there been acquisitions? Have there been mergers? Okay, have new additional people been brought in? And at the same time, when you bring in additional staff and, and so forth, add branch offices and a couple other things we're going to talk about, do we add additional compliance staff? Does compliance staff keep up with the day-to-day -day operations? I think some of the other areas that we're talking about New products. Uh, this is always something, and there are certain products that are always on the radar of the regulators. And some of these products are variable annuities, alternative investments, options, and things like that that the regulators always, you know, have a uh, have a certain view of. And during the course of an examination, they will take take a look at. Um, you know, if yes. I could jump, jump in right there, um, <clears throat> you know. I hope that uh, you're finding clients who are consulting with you uh, before some of these decisions are taking place. Uh, very often uh, we find uh, that the decisions about the development and implementation or sales programs regarding new products uh, are really led by the business folks and consulting uh, uh, firms, if they're brought in at all, or compliance, even internal compliance is almost an afterthought, which can really be uh, uh, problematic. Um, I would add lots of types of structured products uh, to that list that that, that you mentioned. Um, clearly, it's uh, in the interest of industry to come up with new products and, and, I, and ideas, uh, but hopefully they're getting some advice on those products or practices in sales that might pose uh, an outside risk. Um, and so um, usually uh, I'm being called for some cleanup when it's someone's view that that hasn't been done. And so a consultant can be extremely valuable in helping them determine um, what an adequate policy and procedure would be uh, in, in that regard, so. Yeah, I think it's also important that looking at the examination priorities, I mean, at the beginning of every year, um, the SEC and FINRA and also the NASA organization comes out with their examination priorities. What is the focus, okay? And firms should look at those. And uh, you're absolutely right, Mark, when firms engage in new activity, um, again, they can go it alone or they could call up a, a, a consulting firm or in your situation, a law firm and say, hey, we're looking at adding new practices. We want to make sure we have some guidance because we want to make sure that we're doing this right. You know, we want to be on on the good side. We want to make sure that we're doing things right. So absolutely, um, you know, firms may do that. And that may be the way that a firm like Oyster actually gets an entree into the firm there because they've called us up. They've notified us and said, hey, we want to do this. Now what's happening is now we're coming to the point where we've implemented it. We've got some things in place. Now we want to test it. And we also want to use, you know, Oyster to possibly do that. Two other things that uh, that I think are also important is that, you know, uh, is a firm overall or maybe a branch office location, 
Is there an increase in complaints, customer inquiries, exception reports, a lot of things like that, okay? So are there reasons, you know, what are the reasons that are driving the need for a mock exam? And I think a number of these that I've talked about um, will, you know, kind of point to the issues that firms want to make sure that they're in a good situation should a regulator walk in the door or maybe even in light of the pandemic of the last year or so send an email and say you know we want to start an exam start producing records <laughs> i know we're going to get to uh, a little bit of how uh regulators are conducting exams in this current environment um i guess i just wanted to reiterate this uh um value of conducting uh the mock exams and sometimes there's this window between a regulatory in inquiry even and when they're going to come in um to uh to ask a, a particular question or to look at a specific set of policies and procedures there's an opportunity to get in there uh, before we move on i would say that there's one other reason um, i think to seriously consider some advice before and that's really for cover um you, i'm sure you have a view as a regulator but very often if uh, even if you come into an institution and find that there's some problem there's two things that we would look for um th that i think we're, are worth highlighting one of them you've mentioned which is red flags were there things that you should have known or should have caused you uh, to drill down deeper or look for the causes of certain issues, like a number of complaints, something that's new, um, or usual some anomalous um, activity? Those things would obviously represent red flags, uh, but also whether you can demonstrate uh, that that review or due diligence was sufficient can often be bolstered by saying that we've gone out and we took this seriously, um, and we hired a consultant to take a look at that, then their independent findings that your policies and procedures are reasonably designed um, are not a complete shield, but they are helpful and persuasive, I think, for most regulators who are looking for whether or not you took any remedial uh, measures. So um, I think those have always been persuasive in, in instances when I had to make a determination on whether or not further action was, was necessary uh, for a firm. But let's say that there, a decision is made to, uh, uh, to conduct a mock exam, whether it's across your entire uh, spectrum of compliance or on a specific issue, um, what is it that you would consider uh, first in your engagement? Yeah, I think in this situation, depending upon how wide versed this may be, one of the things, um, you know, does the firm have an exam module? Does the firm have a branch office module? So depending upon where we're heading, you know, are we going to use the firm module? Are we going to use maybe a module that a firm like Oyster has created? Okay, so we'll make a determination on that. And the things that will drive if there is a number one, if a module is used at all, then which one is used is that, you know, is the module that we're going to use, is it adequate? Is it complete? Does it address the issues that are that are necessary? Okay, so, you know, one of the things we wanna make sure is that if we're looking at branch office activity, that the firm has a branch office module. Not only do they have a module, but is, again, is it adequate to make sure that the issues that are necessary to be covered are in fact, uh, contained within that module. We can make tweaks to the module, we can do certain things and, and, and so forth. But I think on in the other situation where, you know, where we're going to do that. So um, in addition, so what we're going to do is determine which module, if any module will be used, and we'll set up the parameters of what the mock exam will review. First thing we'll do is we'll get a, a look at the firm's policies and procedures, okay? Same situation. We're going to review those policies and procedures, either firm wide or depending upon if this is kind of a scaled back or focus on a certain part of the firm, we'll look at that. Number one, is there a written policy? Is it adequate? Has it been provided to the staff? And, more, and most importantly, is it enforced? Want to make sure that there are issues out there that, you know, that, uh, you know, you know, there's, if you got a policy, you got to look, you got to let people know what the policy is. It's got to be adequate. It's got to be followed. 
and there needs to be some sort of ramifications for not following that. Okay, so so that's that's kind of what we look at. So a lot of things that we kind of look at when we're looking at the you know, um, the modules and the policies and procedures and uh, want to make sure that we address certain things. And one of the things we're looking at is that have regulatory updates uh, been taken into consideration? Have they been added, you know, to the policies and procedures? Um, you know, so we're talking regulatory updates, case law, or business changes. Again, we talk about new products, bringing on new individuals, um, you know, and, and so forth. So a couple of things that I want to make sure that if we're looking at a firm today, maybe versus a year or two ago, do they have policies and procedures for do they have do they have policies and procedures um, for things like Reg BI? You know that is now in the forefront. That went effective in June of 2020. Okay, um, the firm didn't have branch offices two years ago. They have branch offices now. I want to make sure that we have policies and procedures. <clears throat> Another particular area out there um, that uh, that we're also looking at right now is environmental social governance, okay? Environmental and social governance. This is, you know, dealing with things like climate change and so forth. And I can tell you since January of 2021, there have been more pronouncements and more activities in ESG than any other topic over that, over a three or four or five month period of time than in my 35 plus years of being a regulator and a consultant. And one other area that we're also looking at that is extremely big, um, especially with you know, also dealing with environmental, social, and governance, business continuity plans. You know, this has become so ever important, um, you know, as a result of, you know, of course, we had, uh, you know, 9-11, where a lot of these business continuity plans actually started. Um, we're also looking, if you look at things that are out there now, wildfires in the West, Hurricanes in the Gulf Coast and, uh, uh, you know, along the eastern seaboard, a lot of things happening, uh, floods, uh, a lot of things that are going on. Uh, very, it's very important for firms to have uh, these, these business, you know, continuity and succession plans in place. So, you know, those are kind of things that we would, would kind of look out. And one other point that when Mark and I were, were discussing, you know, one of the things, if you're at the module or the plan you're using to conduct a review is flawed or not adequate, then the results of your review are going to be flawed or less than adequate. And especially when you're looking at, you know, setting these up. And again, what Mark says, you're doing a dry run because you maybe expect a regulator to come in. But I'm going to suggest even more important by doing this dry run you're actually out there looking at how the firm is interacting and dealing with clients. Okay, so you're looking at this from a regulatory viewpoint, but also how is the firm dealing with its clients? And everybody knows compliance and reputation when you're dealing with clients are paramount of a paramount importance to a firm. Okay, you have compliance issues. It's published on, you know, IARD or CRD. Uh, your reputation when you've got lawsuits and so forth, they make it into the news. So one of the things that you want, again, you want to look at is from a regulatory standpoint, but also from a customer protection and customer service viewpoint. Hey, Bill, you raise a good point on, um, well, obviously several uh, good points, but let me jump in on the business continuity question. Uh, over the past year, uh, it, we've seen uh, the entire kind of regulatory apparatus uh, attempt to uh, respond uh, to the business reality of working virtually. Now, working yeah. virtually um, is hopefully something that is contemplated in the policies and procedures of um, of the institutions. If not, of course, they had to create a um, a set of procedures uh, around that. And I've rarely seen um, a mock exam or or a review. Uh, come through, you know, perfectly with no marks. And most regulators would tell you that that's not even the intention. It's an investor protection uh, a vehicle. Um, they're looking for whether or not you are adequately uh, providing, um, you're adequately providing protection and the policies and procedures are reasonably designed 
So that's not a, a perfect design. And where you find them, that you are taking some uh, remedial uh, measures. But my view is that when examiners come in, I think one of the first things they are going to look at whenever you're next examined is this perfect storm example of business continuity. They'll just look and see how you've been operating your business during this period of, uh, of, of, the, of the business uh, disruption. Uh, so in terms of even being subject to a review, what are you saying um, in terms of examination of both uh, your uh, cyber protections, we'll say, um, or having all of your employees operate from their own individual uh, silos? And do you think regulators will regard each of those home offices and basements or wherever you're working from to be a quote unquote office of the firm? Well, I, I think you bring up a good Right, Mark. I, I mean, look, everything shut down, you know, last March. Uh, a lot of firms were were prepared. A lot of firms already had people working from home. I myself, as a consultant, you know, work from home. I've worked from home now for almost the last eight and a half to nine years. Before that, I worked in an office, in a regulatory office. Um, but it's a situation. I, I think what you have to look at is that you have to look at, you know, what type of parameters have the has the firm established? Okay, um, you know we they sent everyone home. Uh, you know I've seen things like uh, you and I are operating on laptops with cameras. Okay, uh, when I go out and do virtual examination, sometimes I deal with people that on their desktop they may not have a camera. You know they may not have the ability to do a virtual meeting like we are today. Um, you know, so it's a situation where, and, and, and if issues come up, um, it's always nice to be able to talk to a person as best you can. And you know, we're having a, you know, a face-to-face -face conversation with people that are, that are in attendance today. I, I think that's, I, I think that's very important for the firm to have the ability to communicate with their people. And I think it's important for registered reps and investment advisor reps to be able to communicate with their clients, whether it be through a Zoom meeting, whether it be through a Microsoft Teams, you know, what whatever that 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 capacity is, I think it's important that if you can't actually meet face to face, whether it be at an office or at a coffee shop or a restaurant, um, you know, having the ability to communicate like we are. I'm not sure 10 years ago if we had you know the issue back in 2010 or 2011 that we would have the capacity to do what we're doing today technology has really moved forward with a lot of with a lot of these steps here um and the other thing mark that that we also talked about when we were going through this process we talked about talking about you know doing these mock exams on a virtual versus a in person you know setting which is kind of an offshoot of, you know, being able to communicate with everyone. Um, and I've done, I've done both of them during the pandemic. People have actually asked me to come to an office and conduct a, a review. And I, but I've done most of these through a virtual type review. But in either way of whether you're doing on-site or virtual, the key to being successful is to be organized. And a lot of things that we're talking and have a game plan. And a lot of things that we're talking about, whether it's pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, is the fact that a lot of these reviews are going to start by making a document request to be provided to you from the firm. So in other words, I may ask for 10 items to be provided. I'm going to tell them the list, give them a description. Most importantly, I'm going to try to have some sort of system in place that's going to allow me and the firm to share a document repository, whether that be something uh, that's out there on something like ShareFile or another type of program, but those documents need to be uh, provided, you know, to me uh, as a consultant for review. The other thing that I've also seen too is that you know um, there are a few differences between virtual and on-site. Okay, virtual, I pull up to the office. I either walk out of the parking lot if it's a strip shopping center right into the office, or sometimes I'll walk in to a to a 20 story building through a lobby and, and, and so forth. The difference between the two of these is that 
if I'm on site, I see everything. If I'm off site, I don't. But one of the ways to overcome that is to have somebody at the branch office take a picture of the front entrance to the building, the signage in the lobby, the signage at the door walking into the lobby. So I can kind of get a framework as to, you know, how security is and how it is getting in into the office. OK, so I think that's 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 very important. Um, you know, as far as whether we're conducting these on a uh, actual or a virtual type of uh, through a virtual type of medium. Well, let me add just real quickly. Uh, I have added uh, to that list is to take a look at the social media presence of the uh, of the institution or uh, of a particular yeah. uh, branch. Uh, sometimes it's as you know simple and binary as just googling uh, yeah. the, the the reps that are in that branch. Uh, to see whether or not there's a policy and procedure around uh, social media, whether or not they're able to have independent accounts. Um, and even if that's randomized, sometimes I uh, find things surprising. I had to reach out to uh, a client uh, last week who now has been doing all of his marketing uh, virtually, essentially has has a solo shop. Um, but I thought was getting uh, a little uh, more bold in, in each of his uh, uh, descriptions of the services that he, he could deliver, um, which is, you know, randomized. Um, but are you finding in a virtual environment that there's been more focus on activity that is kind of pushed into cyberspace? Well, I think when you look at all the social media websites that are out there, I mean, there's there's a lot of them, you know, more common ones are, of course, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter and and, and things like that. Other ones out there. OK. So, yes, we do review that activity. We also look at something as simple as a website. I mean, every potential investor or client for that firm can go on uh, to that website and find out just about anything about about the company itself. What I look for when I'm looking at that is number one, you're right. Is there a policy procedure that addresses what they can and cannot do and approval to be on that? But more important is the information that's on those websites. Is it current? Is it correct? Is it something that might be, and I see this often, some of these, some of the information on these websites and media sites could be four, five, six, even seven years old. These things are out there. They're added to, but they're never reviewed, uh, you know, as to whether or not the, the information is in fact timely. So yes, we have a, that is a big part of the uh, whether whether it's an on-site or a virtual review. That's a, an excellent point, and there's been guidance from regulators, uh, lest anybody uh, be confused, what is publicly uh, disseminated uh, to uh, the public uh, through social media and email certainly count as books and records of the company, and they need to be reviewed in accordance. I always really wish we had more time. There's so many more things that we could talk about, um, but. Uh, we're coming up on, on our 30 minutes. I want to be respectful uh, of everybody's time. Um, but be not dismayed. Uh, Bill Riley and I will be back for uh, a second uh, coffee chat on this topic. I'm not sure it really has a formal title yet, but I'll call it, uh-oh, you've been examined and their findings now what? Um, and so we can't wait to uh, come back to talk to you about that. Uh, same bat time same bad channel on July 14th. So, I mean, that concludes our coffee chat for uh, today. The next coffee chat for the firm will be conducted on June uh, 30th. My colleague, Debbie Brenneman, will be discussing all things non-competes. To register for this or future coffee chat discussions, visit the events page on Thompson Hines website. And we encourage you to go to the library of our past coffee chat uh, which will have a repository of our recordings and is available on Thompson Hines YouTube channel. So with that, I want to thank everybody for uh, listening in or watching in on our program today. And a special thank you to Bill for sharing his great ideas and insight about when a mock exam um, is useful and when a consultant should be consulted. So when the webinar ends, you'll be prompted to take a quick survey. We hope that you'll take a few minutes to answer uh, those questions and let us know what you think of our driving. With that, thanks again, Bill. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.